Hello and welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where each week, Pastor Jeff Cranston explores biblical theology that provides practical life applications in an understandable way. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Tiffany Coker, along with my dad, Pastor Jeff Cranston. We are seeking not only to help you know deep, solid biblical theology, but to know the word of God and the promises of God that are given to us in his word, all while holding to solid theological truths in your heart, soul, and mind. We hope that you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving week, and we are back with today's podcast. Uh, We're going to look at another fairly well-known New Testament letter of the Apostle Paul's. It is the letter to the church at Colossae, known to us simply as Paul's letter to the Colossians. If you're new here with us at Kitchen Table Theology, we are walking through every Bible book, discovering the theological themes contained in each book, along with a summarizing overview. So, Dad, let's go ahead and jump in today. Yep. Hello, Kitchen Table Theologians. Thanks for joining us. We're uh, we're post-Thanksgiving. If you're listening to us week to week, if you're listening to this in 2025, if we're all still a <laughs> Yeah, we've we've just had Thanksgiving. So it's good to have you join us again. Well, maybe a little background to get us started here. Let's cover some of the basics. I know we just said that Paul wrote the letter, but is there proof of that? Is that contested at all? Maybe tell us when was the book written? A few things like that. Give us some of the background. Sure. Well, as you said, it it was written by the Apostle Paul, and he wrote this to Christians living in the small city of Colossae. It was probably written around 62 A.D. I think that's a that's a date many agree upon. While Paul was in prison in Rome, so this was about the same time he wrote Ephesians and Philemon, and we know that all three letters were sent out to their respective destinations with two men, Tychicus and Onesimus. Before we get going on that more, where is the city of Coloss- Colossi? Colossae? Colossae? How did you Colossae. say that? I'm sorry. Colossae. I pronounce it Colossae. Oh, Colossae. Okay. Can we visit that city today? Well, I looked into this, and according to the Biblical Archaeological Review, Colossae is an unexcavated site, and it sits near the modern city of Honaz at the base of Mount Cadmus in modern Turkey. That's where it's located. So it's it's near the other biblical sites that we may be familiar with, Laodicea and Hierapolis. And as I said, they appear in the Bible. Michael Trainer, he explores, I, I read it, it was so good. Uh, he explores Colossae in an article he wrote called Colossae Colossal in Name Only, published in the Biblical Archaeological Review. And we'll link that article for you in the episode notes. It's really fascinating. He he guides readers through the region's references in the Bible, historical and archaeological sources and traditions. So you can go. They know where the New Testament city, I guess, is located. It's just not been excavated at this point. I'm not real sure why. Uh, probably because everything eventually comes down to money. The city of Colossae appears only one time in the Bible, and that's in Colossians 1, verse 2. And Paul says to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae. Yet, there is no indication in the New Testament that Paul ever visited the city of Colossae. And in fact, in Colossians 2, verse 1, he writes, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. So I I think that statement implies that those at Colossae and nearby Laodicea had never seen Paul. Uh, Although their history, Colossae's does, spans millennia. This site, as I said, has never been excavated. Archaeologists believe they know exactly where the city was located, but up to this point, No one has ever undertaken that challenge. And I'm sure somebody will do it. And I'm sure whenever they do it, it will unearth an amazing number of discoveries. That could be quite interesting. All right. So that's a bit about the city, the author, the recipients. So we have a young church meeting in what is now, I guess you said, sort of Southwest Turkey. 
-hmm. Paul had never been there, but clearly something must have been going on. What was going on in this time that he felt it necessary to write to the church there? Yeah, I mean, who writes who writes a letter to people they've never they've met, never met? met. So that's a great question. <laughs> it appears to us that that Paul had received a report during the first time he was imprisoned in Rome, uh, a report that likely came from Epaphras, a, a fellow minister, who who by the way many believe was the leader of the church at Colossae. Epaphras was likely like the leading elder or pastor of the Colossian church. Paul Paul references Epaphras and to the Colossians and, and says that he was, quote, one of you, end quote. And then he calls Epaphras a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. So we also believe Epaphras was a convert of Paul's when Paul ministered for two years in Ephesus. The Philemon 123 tells us Epaphras went to Rome in part to serve Paul during his imprisonment. So this man Epaphras was um, extremely well known to Paul. And it, it appears Epaphras confided in Paul regarding some dangerous teaching the Colossians were hearing. And the teaching was one that lessened the role of Christ and undermined the new identity of believers in Christ. Now, the introduction to this letter in the English Standard Bible Study Bible, a really excellent translation, the English Standard Version, it's called the English Standard Bible Study Bible. And the, the, their introduction, it says this, Paul wrote to warn against this false teaching and to encourage the believers and their growth toward Christian maturity. He emphasizes Christ's authority over all evil powers. Christians are united with the risen Christ, and therefore, they share in his power and authority. Paul also encouraged the believers to fight against sin, pursue holiness, and live as distinctly Christian households. You know, I think a lot of us probably are fascinated with how all of this came about, but I have to wonder also, once these letters are written, so Paul gets this message, he's going to write his letter. I know we've talked about this before, but it's so interesting to me. How do they actually get to the recipients? You can't just drop them in the mail. Paul was huh. in prison. He couldn't travel there and take the letter himself. So just with all of this going on, with no postal service, he's in prison. How do the believers actually receive this letter? Yeah, that's that's something we might not think about that often. We just assume yeah, he wrote the letter and somehow it got to where it was going. And often it was hundreds and hundreds of miles away. We know, for example, that when Paul finished the letter to the Romans, he, he wrote that from Corinth and that he entrusted it to a woman named Phoebe. And Phoebe hand carried it to, and don't talk about friends right now. I know where your mind went as soon as I said Phoebe. <laughs> you did. I know. We talked about that on the Romans podcast, I think, when you were oh, we did. telling us this. <laughs> I think we did. Yes. <laughs> I won't go back there. <laughs> Her name was Phoebe, and she, she hand carried it to Rome from Corinth, which is in Greece, where, where Paul was in prison then. And so you just have to imagine she, she must have ridden a cart or some sort of conveyance. She maybe likely rode an animal of some sort. She would have walked. She would have had to have taken a ship. And it was about 750 miles away or about 1,200 kilometers away. You think about that, it was an incredible feat. So as, as far as delivering the letter to the Colossians, we know Paul sent the letter along with the letters to Philemon and to the Ephesian church with Tychicus, who was accompanied by Onesimus. Okay, you say we know that Paul sent it through them. I'll ask the question, how do we know that? Well, I was really just making all that up. We don't really know that. No, we, <laughs> yeah. do, we do know that. We, we know that because the Bible tells us <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> in, in Colossians 4, we, we read, Paul says this. So he's saying this to the Colossians. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose. So that's how the letter got to the Colossians by Tychicus. He also mentions Onesima in that same verse. And the book of Acts also gives some information regarding this as well. So here's another proof of that. Tiff, why don't you read Philemon chapter 1, verses 10 to 12 for us, because that gives us some insight as well. Philemon 1, chapter 10 through 12. 
I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whom I fathered in my imprisonment, who previously was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wanted to keep with me, so that in your behalf he might be at my service in my imprisonment for the gospel. So you may recall that Onesimus was a runaway slave or bond servant, and he belonged to Philemon's household, but Onesimus, he ran off, and he got to Rome, and he, he sought out Paul in Rome, apparently was brought to faith in Christ by Paul. Uh, and that's what Paul says, whom I fathered. He's talking about Onesimus, and he says, whom I fathered in my imprisonment. Well, he doesn't mm-hmm. mean, you know, as his physical son, is his spiritual son. And he became like a son to Paul, and he, he carried Paul's letter back to Philemon. Very, very interesting. I love to think through all of those things. But let's get back to the theology in Colossians. This is why we're here, right? <laughs> so yeah, we know why, right. why Paul wrote the letter. I can imagine there's a lot of theology in this book. So let's start walking through some of the more pertinent theological themes. Where do you suggest that we start with that? Yeah, I think the best place to start is what I believe and and many believe to be the overarching theme of the book, and that is the preeminence of Christ, the preeminence of Christ. And not only his preeminence, but also his sufficiency in all things. So he's preeminent and he is sufficient. So in this letter, Paul presents Christ. Re- remember, he's, he's attacking some false teaching, which is seeking to notch Christ down a, a few levels. And Paul presents Christ as the center of the universe, not only as the active creator, but also as the recipient of creation. And by that, I mean when Christ took on human flesh. Paul tells us Christ was and is the visible image of the invisible God, containing within himself the fullness of the Godhead. And because of his divine nature, Paul wants us to know Jesus is sovereign, he's preeminent, He's all sufficient, and above all things, he is. He's above all things with authority that has been given him by the Father. I mean, that's a lot to take in. Wow. (laughs) So when you say that Christ is all sufficient, what do you really mean by that? Do you mean he is all sufficient for salvation alone, or do you mean that his sufficiency goes beyond even that? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So let me let, let me answer that with an illustration. There, there's this incredibly large truck that I man, this thing is awesome, and it was built for speed, and it's called the Shockwave Jet Truck. So anybody who loves horsepower is getting excited right now. <laughs> the, the guys who race these, they actually have two trucks on the racing team. The other one's called the Super Shockwave. And it's built on a 1957 Chevy pickup frame, if you can imagine. But let's go to the big one. The Shockwave jet truck is built on a 1984 Peterbilt frame. So that's the, the, that Peterbilt is the tractor part of what we call a tractor trailer, similar to what you see on the interstates and the highways today, a big old, you know, semi truck body. So just to give you an example of the speed and power of these trucks, the 57 pickup contains two Westinghouse J34-48 jet engines. And in the mile, the the truck hit 336 miles an hour in one mile. The the bigger truck, the Shockwave, has 36,000 horsepower, which is enough, if you can think of it like this as a comparison, it's enough to accelerate at 3 Gs vertically which is as much as the space shuttles had. So why, you know, I probably lost half of our kitchen table theologians on that. The other half have already started Googling these trucks. (laughs) Why that? Well, because I think they, they, they illustrate the sufficiency of Christ and what it, what it means. So Paul writes in Colossians that we are strengthened according to his glorious might might, his power, his strength. So that means that there's more than enough power to spare for all the issues 
we face. I mean, whatever we face, Christ has the power for that situation and then some. And, and in the same way that 36,000 horsepower truck is more than enough to propel the truck on land. You know, you, you only would need about, I mean, our cars are what, 150 to 250 horsepower. That's all it takes to go down the interstate. But no, this truck's got 36,000. So Christ's power is more than sufficient to enable every believer to live the transformed Christ-filled life and, and help us deal with every situation in life that we face. That's amazing. And I am going to have to Google that. So fascinating. Oh, you got to do. You got to YouTube it because yeah. those <laughs> things are incredible to watch. My boys would probably love to see that. They'll, but yeah, they'll love a, it. It's a great example, too, of the sufficiency. So we have his preeminence and all sufficiency as theological themes. What other themes do we see in Colossians? Well, let's just share two more quickly. And and one is particularly appropriate because we're recording this the week of Thanksgiving. We've already said, hope you had a great Thanksgiving, but actually went with a little, little podcasting secret here, folks. We're recording this three days prior to Thanksgiving. So we're in faith, we're saying we hope you had a good one when you hear this. So another theme is found in the word knowledge. One one of the themes, let, just two, two more themes real quick. We'll do knowledge and we'll do thanksgiving. Those themes come through. So knowledge, Paul, that, that's a theme, knowledge. Uh, g- the Greek word is gnosis. And Paul writes with some language that reflects the philosophical and religious thought of his day especially ideas about acquiring special knowledge that can lend itself to salvation apart from Christ. So what do I mean? Paul takes the language of the time, transforms its understanding so that it serves the proclamation that Christ is the source of all knowledge, of all spiritual wisdom, and of all understanding. That's chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. So how is that possible? Well, Paul tells us in chapters 1, 2, and 4, and he says, Christ is the one in whom God's mystery has been revealed. And so knowledge becomes ours that was previously unknown to the prophets. But when it comes to the gospel, it's unknown to the angels. Even a- angels right now don't understand the gospel fully. Human beings do. So there's a, there's a special divine knowledge that comes through Christ and because of Christ into the life of, of a believer. And let's wrap it up with our last theme. You said it, Thanksgiving. Well, it's very typical in Paul's letters. He expresses Thanksgiving for the relationship in Christ that Paul shares with the believers in Colossae and, and that he you know, shares in Christ with, with us. And, and he begins verse 3 of chapter 1 by saying, I always thank God. And he, and he references the relationship they have in Christ, although they've never met face to face. And the relationship for which Paul gives thanks is based on the familiar triad that Paul loved to use, faith, hope, and love. And he says in verses 4 and 5, For we've heard of your faith, there's faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So kitchen table theologian, as you find yourself reading through Paul's writings from time to time, pay special attention to the words faith, love, and hope. Paul was a huge fan of this trinity of superlatives, and they appear often in his writings. And so you've got preeminence, you've got all sufficiency, you have knowledge, you have thanksgiving. I think these are four of the key theological themes in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Well, thank you for sharing that with us today. And hopefully, Kitchen Table Theologian, you learned a little bit more about Paul's letter to the Colossians. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast today with Pastor Jeff. If you enjoy this podcast, would you take just a second and leave a rating or review on iTunes? We really do appreciate that. And that is honestly what helps get the word out so other people can hear about Kitchen Table Theology. Be sure to subscribe, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, whatever your favorite way to listen to podcasts is. You can continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's word to our lives. Don't forget to check out today's episode notes. We will link that one article for you. You can find those and more at jeffcranston.com. You can also email us anytime you have questions at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. 
As always, thanks are due to our friends at Low Country Community Church here in Bluffton, South Carolina, and at Streamline Podcast for making this podcast possible. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be back in the Old Testament and exploring the book of First Chronicles. Until then, always remember that the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. Thanks for joining us at the table. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, please check out our show notes. If you have a question from today's podcast, kindly email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.